Welcome to Hatching Creativity. This isn't just another behavioral health podcast. This is the place where thought leaders converge to talk about real life challenges, breakthroughs, and pivotal aha moments. Mike, what, where I want to begin also, because I, you know, you invited me to tell a little bit of my story also. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I was a college student in the mid 70s. I was also, now I identify as a gay man, but I was married to a woman at that time. Okay. So I had a lot of confusion around my sexual identity. I went to the college library and these were some of the books that I found. Now there was a very limited, limited amount of books available in my research library. In fact, for those of us who know, remember the card index file, you had to open that little wooden box and find an ID card. And then you saw who took the book out before you. And that was also part of my curiosity. So who else took some of these books out? But because I never found anyone else that I could talk to or knew about. So, you know, I talk about the limited information that was sometimes out there. So previous generations, you know, these are some of the stories that were passed on to them that was kind of limited. The other point I wish to make is I did go at the time to talk to my family physician, my primary care doctor, who not only treated me, treated my then ex, soon to be ex-wife, my parents, my grandparents, even my in-laws. And I asked him, how would someone know if they were gay? And what he did was he asked me, why would I ask that question? And I immediately sensed that sense of shame that even by asking someone, how would you know if you were gay? I was doing something wrong. But the next thing he did was even more impactful. He said, if you're gay, you're going to need a lot of help. And I said, yes, I'm like nodding. That's why I'm talking to you. But then he said, that is a very sad and lonely life. So talk about getting a negative message. And this message is coming from a physician a person that I trust, that my family trusted. He not only said that's a very negative and lonely life, sad, lonely life, you're going to need a lot of help. And he reached over and he got a script pad and he wrote me a script for benzodiazepines, tranquilizers, labrum at the time, 10 milligrams, three times a day, more as needed. Just because at the age of 21, I asked a doctor, how would someone know if they were gay or not? So when I talk about why this became my life passion, I know looking back on my history, I was not experiencing a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression or anything else that warranted me being prescribed medications. What I did is I had a question and the doctor, instead of answering the question or having a positive response for me, chose to medicate me. And that really was, I'll be honest with you, where my addiction kind of spiraled because once the medication came from a doctor, It opened the door for me to using all other kinds of substances. And it's not about blaming him, but it's about recognize what um, inappropriate (laughs) or negative treatment can have an effect on someone. And that's like the the general theme of what I talk about is how we need to improve our treatment and improve the standards of what kind of treatment we offer to LGBT individuals. Back then, there was no one that I could talk to. I went to Uh, After getting the medication from the psychiatrist, I actually called up the local hospital and asked to talk to someone in their mental health department. And I on the phone said, "Um, is there like a gay therapist I can talk to? And they asked me, why would I ask that question? I said, well, I'm kind of struggling with my own identity. I think if I had a gay therapist to talk to. And the person on the phone said to me, that's a very inappropriate question. Wow. They're like. You don't, you know, if you need help, we'll help you, but there has nothing, you know, we don't have gay therapists in this facility, nor do we have anyone that, you know, and I'm like, again, did I do something wrong just for asking that questions? I really thought, hey, maybe I need someone that kind of understands. Now, I was very fortunate. I eventually did go to a mental health center and the therapist I worked with was not gay. So I'm not saying that you have to be a gay therapist to provide LGBT affirmative care. But what I'm saying is our systems of care sometimes don't even recognize the specific needs of an LGBT person. My need at the time was to have some type of a role model, some type of a positive influence, because up until that time, none of my teachers, none of the friends of the families. None of my relatives, no one I knew in my neighborhood had ever come out. This is, again, this is going back to 1976, 1978. And it was all part of the process I had to go through. And I hope that by the work that I and my colleagues do, 
we are perhaps preventing someone from having, we have lost so many young people, trans people to suicide, to drug overdose, uh, you know, that it, it's really important that we recognize some of the treatment needs that are necessary for someone to embrace and develop and maintain their sobriety or their mental health well-being. Not everyone necessarily has a problem with with active addiction, but there's many behavioral health issues that come into play. Sure. And those issues also affect the family. And there's a lot of things that a family can do to provide acceptance to a, to a young person in their in their family. You know, Phil, um, a couple of things really just struck me there, and, and I'm, I just want to pull back for a second. You know, the story that you talked about in 1976, coming to your physician and asking for, for some advice, right? Um, this seems like it's a 1970s kind of a thing, but in many places, this is still happening. It's We're not that far from it. And it's it really is important that that is understood. You know, there mm-hmm. are certain places in the country, <laughs> right. maybe California, uh, you know, the Northeast, some places, um, maybe certain areas of Florida, and there are pockets, right? But in terms of generalities, we really have to talk about how to uh, one, you know, when this is happening. What's and and this is this is kind of where a couple of questions I have for you. When somebody does find themselves in a situation like this with a with a doctor, or in a situation like that, kind of what do they do? Um, I, I want also want to talk a little bit about resources and, mm-hmm. and getting into that. So we can do that now, or we can wait a little bit. But people have to know of a safe place that they can go to get quality information. And I want to make sure that we touch on that too. Sure. Thank, thanks, Mike. I think that's an excellent question. And, you know, again, my personal history goes back to being alive and present during the early years of the feminist movement and also hearing and reading on the newspapers about how lesbians were not actively included, but the feminist ideas and the feminist theories were so important, including recognizing how women need to learn to take care of their bodies because they couldn't rely on the healthcare system to adequately do that. And, and you know, these early publications, some of them are still in existence now um, was like the benchmark of women's health. And I think that we now have, there are actual resources that we have that talk about the healthcare needs of gay men, of lesbians, of transgender individuals. There's federal documents that have been published by SAMHSA that include these healthcare needs. Now, I'm a health educator recognized working at a major university uh, one of the largest healthcare training universities. I work at the medical school, the School of Nursing, the School of Public Health. So I teach this to our students. And personally, there are times that I'm in a doctor's office as a patient and they're like, oh, so you work at Rutgers, you're an educator and what do you do there? And I tell them and they're like, oh, wow. And I asked them, did you have training on LGBT health care when you were you know, in med school or nursing school? And they're like, oh, absolutely not. No, never, never. And then they start asking me some questions, but you know, for everyone that asks me questions and I'm able to educate them, there's so many others that again, are ignorant. And the ignorance is, again, that's not putting blame and saying like they were never taught it. So therefore they don't recognize the importance of it. Once a healthcare recognizes the importance of LGBT understanding of health issues, the disparities that exist, then they're going to be more inclined to utilize preventive strategies that can also help the community. Well, you know, it's also interesting that you that you mentioned that because Part of the conversations that I've been hearing and people have been pushing on me, which I, which uh, you know I, I try to to push back to the best I can, which is they don't want to teach their kids about LGBTQ because they feel that that's going to influence the decisions that their kid makes. And I think that's extremely harmful. You know, mm-hmm. again, you're you're really telling people that this is not, a thing, you know, pay no attention to what's really going on. You're not mature enough to know the truth. And it's, it really is very damaging for a lot of people. Mike, I mean, that is such a, again, uh, it's a powerful question that you're asking. I can only tell you as a sexologist, I know that adolescent child sexual understanding begins at about age three. 
Mm -hmm. At about age three, we begin to recognize there's a distinction between our gender, the gender we were born in or assigned when we were born, and then the gender of others. And it continues for another three or four years where we come to an understanding. It's very typical for many, you know, I think of my play school years in, in kindergarten, how people played house and set up different roles and different games that they played that many of it was gender based. But mm -hmm. the reality is not everyone subscribed to that. You know, a young child said, well, today I'm going to play the daddy and you can play the mommy. And it wasn't based on what the gender of the person was. It was based on how they felt in the play that they were doing. And yet we then have adults come in and say, oh, no, 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 no. Boys have to act this way. Girls have to act that way. So think about the significance of gender stereotyping that begins in our early adolescent development. And yet children by themselves make no judgment about it. They're very yeah. comfortable. And in fact, we know it's been shown in research that has been done. And I know as a community, we are often under research, but many young children are very adaptable when a friend, one of their fellow students come out as saying they're gender non-conforming or they don't relate to being a boy or a girl or any gender other. And the kids just go, okay. And they're like, you know, so do you want to play? That's, I mean, that's all they want to do. They want to, they want to play. They want to talk. They want to, you know, it's when the adults come in and say, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Or you shouldn't do that. Or we have to, you know, protect. It's not, if we were protecting children, there's so many other things children are at risk for. Yeah. We spend we, so much time talking about stranger danger. And yet many children are harmed in their own family household, not just because they're gay or lesbian, just because of their innocence as children. and yet. We sometimes are in some areas we're ignorant about that happening also. That's also, you know, I work on sexual violence prevention, not just about LGBT kids being abused, but many children are abused and they're abused by someone that's known to the family. So again, the family has a responsibility mm -hmm. to raise healthy children. Healthy children should not be judged because they have beliefs about their gender that's normal and and part of their natural process. And yes, there are times that a child might enjoy, you know, I think of like, you know, young boys or young girls who dress in like opposite gender. They want to be a fairy princess one day. They want to be a uh, G.I. Joe the next. And you know what? And that's just part of child curiosity. Sure, let them but try that's it. Not, and, and that's what people do. And then eventually they come to an understanding of their gender and what is significant to them. So there's a variation here when we talk about gender identity and gender expression. But people sometimes get so fixated on, oh, my God, why is that little boy walking around the amusement park with a tiara and a fairy wand? Why? Because he's in a happy place. You know, well, you know, or why is that girl wearing a cowboy hat? And because she wants to pretend to be a cowboy because she sees cowboys as exciting. And, you know, so again, we put those conditions on children, which is really unfortunate. We do that in so many areas of society to, you know, even to, to pull the lens back a little bit, right? Um, what a man is, what a man should be, what a woman is, what a woman should be. You know, um, for those of you who know me, you know, I had uh, I came from an abusive first marriage where I was always told what a man should be and what I was and what I wasn't and um, and what a woman was and what a woman should be and what she was and what she wasn't. And it was so harmful, these constructs. And that was, you know, and that was without dealing with all of the other layers of shame that other um, aspects of society puts on you. It really is damaging and, and it really is bothersome, these, these constructs, these stereotypes that we're kind of pushed to live in and to conform to. Um, you know, it's really, it's really against the basic idea of United States and America, right? I mean, this is really flies right in the face of the whole purpose of the, the liberty that we all talk about. Thanks for tuning into Hatching Creativity. We appreciate your support. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and tell all your friends about the show. And remember, it's never just about one thing.